Welcome Sunday School teachers and Bible study leaders to a, a brief overview of the Explore the Bible lesson of Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 14 for Sunday, August 29th, 2021. One introduction I might use to begin this lesson, and I think it would work well for older classes, but the more I think about it, I think it will work well for younger classes too, because even many adult one and adult two age group people are starting to feel their age. I might start by asking, what do you dislike most about growing old? Lots of things people can say there. Some will say, well, my weight or my hair, uh, my hair color or my hair loss, uh, a whole lot of things. There could be some really good uh, discussion there. <laughs> One of the things that gets to me, I, uh, my physical decline, uh, this last Easter, we had our grandkids over and we had a little race in the yard. And man, I was just hobbling along. I thought, oh my goodness. Uh, we, we've all got stories like that. So I think that, that could start your class with some good discussion. Every, everybody's got to something like that to share. All that to say that last week in our lesson, we talked about how we are all going to die. We, we need to be able to face death. This week, we're going to talk about how we face life, how we spend life. And one of them, uh, one of the applications we'll look at is that, that uh, what we need to do with our lives when we're young. We need to serve the Lord when we're young. We finished our study on, on Ecclesiastes this week uh, with, with the whole last chapter of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. It's a fitting conclusion to all the questions and uncertainty of, of uh, a lot of Ecclesiastes, but it has a strong and godly conclusion. So you really need to make this a, a strong conclusion uh, to encourage people, dedicate your life to the Lord and serve him with the time that you have right now. Now, I myself uh, might teach this in three points. Uh, number one, the great lesson that it gives us. Number two, the great illustration. And number three, the great conclusion. So uh, you could do that. You can do it another way. That's how I might do it. But you can use some of these points hopefully along the way. Number one, the first great lesson that we see here is found in verse one. He says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth. We just talked about how we're all getting older and some of the problems that we have. So here he says, remember to serve God when you are young. Now you might ask your class, why do you think people need this reminder? Why do they need a reminder to serve God when, when you're young? And of course, people come up with a number of answers uh, because many put it off. They think they can do it later. Uh, of course, the problem is many do. And even if you do, you've wasted the, the, the best part of your life. It could have been given to, to God and invested in eternity. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in a message in our church, I mentioned the author, uh, Oscar Wilde, who lived a really wicked and, and profligate life. I just read a book, though, that says something I had never heard before, that on his deathbed, he actually called for a priest and, and repented and gave his life to the Lord. Never heard that before. Uh, so he was possibly saved at his deathbed if that happened. Uh, thank God for that. But on the other hand, what a waste that his whole life was spent in uh, uh, just a horrible way on, on evil. Far better to serve God with your life. Uh, you could also use the example of uh, investing for retirement. How much better to start saving for retirement when you're uh, 20 years old than you're 60 years old. You're going to have tons more saved up than if you wait. Well, it's the same with your life. It is far better to live for Jesus now, to begin investing in eternity now, than to wait. You'll have much more waiting for you in heaven, and you will have lived a life worth living. We've all heard the story of uh, the two uh, who were baptized in a church one day. One was a little boy. One was an, an old gentleman who was baptized, and somebody says, Oh, how great. What a great thing that this elderly man was saved. But the other person says, How much better that this young child was saved who can now live his whole life for the Lord. That's what this is saying. Better to remember your creator in the days of your youth. And of course, as many of us know, statistics tell us if you don't remember him in the days of your youth, you're probably not going to do it at all. So that, that first great lesson, serve the Lord in the days of your youth. And then we come secondly to the great illustration. This begins in verse two with before, serve the Lord while you're young, before. And, and now begins this great illustration in verses two through six. Uh, we, we just talked about how we're all getting older and things that happen to us as we age. 
verses two uh, through seven rather, are a vivid picture, an illustration of that. It, it might be hard to see it at, at first reading. Someone coming across this passage might go, what in the, what in the world is, is this all talking about? Golden bowl and silver cord and, and, and all this stuff. But you need to understand what these are. These are a series of word pictures that describe what it feels like and what happens to you when, you're, when you age. The teacher's book describes some of these, that uh, the, the, the women who grind grain cease because they're few. The grinding is talking about your teeth. They become few when you're old, so you can't grind the grain. Those who look through the windows grow dim. It's talking about how your eyes grow dim and, and so on. The teacher's book has some good exposition on that. Uh, one exercise you could do with your class is have them look at these series of verses and have them guess what they think each of these pictures of the aging person represents. Uh, so some of them are pretty obvious. Some of them uh, take, uh, take a little bit of a imagination or understanding. I will say, the best exposition I have ever heard on this text was a sermon from Carl F.H. Henry at the 1987 Southern Baptist Convention in St. Louis, 35 years ago. But I still remember some parts of it so well. Uh, I should have had you actually listen to the first 10 minutes of the sermon as an introduction to the meaning of Ecclesiastes. But starting at about 14 minutes and 50 seconds of the message, he begins expounding on Ecclesiastes 12 especially, and he does it through the rest of the uh, of the sermon. If you can get this and listen to it, it would be a great help to you. In it, he interprets the meaning of each of these word pictures. Some of his interpretations are a little bit different from the teacher's book. He says the sun and, and the moon and the stars are your mind. He talks about how you begin to lose the sharpness of your mind when you get older, and he, he does it in, a, in, a, in an amazing way. He talks about how the clouds will come after rain, uh, speak of increasing illness. The, the, he, he talked about how the grinders are actually the standard Old Testament word for teeth. So they are referring to teeth. He says of verse 6 that the Hebrew rabbis referred to those four things in verse 6 as the four uh, most common means of death. The silver cord is the, is the snapping of the spinal cord. The golden bowl is the skull that can be crushed. The pitcher shattered is talking about a heart attack and a cistern uh, being lost, uh, the, the loss of blood. So that, that's how the Hebrew scholars uh, interpreted that. It is a very interesting sermon. You can actually listen to his sermon. Uh, I have not seen a video of it available. If you find a video uh, of it, you post it in the comments because I, I would love to see it. But you can listen to an audio version of that Carl F.H. Henry sermon on Ecclesiastes 12, uh, and it's called Life Without the Emmanuel Factor. And I will post that web address in the comments so you can click on it and go and listen to this. I would strongly encourage it. Remember, the first 10 minutes of the sermon is kind of an overview of the whole book of Ecclesiastes. And at about 14 minutes and 50 seconds, if you just want to go straight there, he starts to interpret these word pictures in Ecclesiastes 12. I think it'd be worth, very worthwhile to you to listen to it. He's, he's, he's an old man himself when he's giving this sermon, but it, it is powerful and it is very, very interesting. But if you wanted a more contemporary picture of this same kind of an illustration of the principle of our, our body aging, uh, think about the, the old song, This Old House. Uh, most of us know that song's not about a house, is it? It's, a, it's about the body. The body's getting old. It's getting ready to meet the saints. Ain't gonna need this house no longer. Ain't gonna need this house no more. Ain't got time to fix the shingles. Ain't got time to fix the floor. All this. I'm going to need this house no longer. I'm getting ready to meet the saints. This old house is getting shaky. This old house is getting old. This old house lets in the rain. This old house lets in the cold. Oh, the knees are getting chilly, but he feels no fear or pain because he seeks a new tomorrow through a golden window pane. Someone once asked Stuart Hamblin, is there a hidden meaning to the words of this song? He said, yes that he and a friend were hunting in California and came across an old broken down cabin and an old prospector had passed away inside that cabin. And, and so the, the significance, not only was the cabin decaying, the man had decayed and died. And so he wrote the song, This Old House, not only about an old house that had decayed, but a man. 
and, uh, and he said, uh, he said, the house of made of wood and steel will come down. But he said, my own house, my body made of clay has got to go too. But he said, there's a big difference between houses and people. He said, the house inside of the Christian uh, in God's own time will be gathered in. He'll be through the Christian will be gathered in. The, the soul in, inside the Christian's house is going to be gathered in with the saints. So that that great song might fit well in your sermon, in your your message at some point, and you, you could you might consider playing it as the introduction to this lesson if you wanted to, or or at this point in your in your message, and uh, and you, you could play the song. And say, what do you think this song is really about? And of course, it's about our body, not the house. So a couple of things you could do with that. Another good illustration here. But the point is. All of our bodies are like this old house. We, 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 we should all be getting ready to meet the saints. So just like last week, we talked about that we, we all have to face death. So this week, it talks about how we all, if we live long enough, we are going to get old. But the important thing is to serve God while we do, which leads us to the third point, which I would call the, the great conclusion, not only to this chapter, but to this whole book of Ecclesiastes. He says in verse 13, after all that he said in Ecclesiastes, he says, this is the conclusion. I mean, we don't have to wonder what the conclusion is. He says, here's the conclusion. Here's the thing. What is it? Fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. So important for you to emphasize this because there's been so much you know, vanity of vanities and, and the life's not worth, you know, is meaningless and, and all of that throughout this whole book. It's so important for you to emphasize here after all that, there is a godly ending to this. There is something worth doing. Fear God and keep his commandments. And then in the, the second part of verse 13, you see what the, the fear of the Lord is. Remember, fear of the Lord does not mean that you walk around in what we might call a craven fear, thinking you're about to get hit with a lightning bolt at any minute. Fear of the Lord means that you're walking, realizing your accountability to God, which causes you to live rightly. And then uh, verse 13b validates that definition. It says, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it's good or evil. See, the person who has the fear of the Lord realizes his accountability to God, that he will be judged by him for what he does. So it affects the way that he lives. Now, the question then becomes, well, who can pass that judgment? When we're all held accountable to God, who can pass that judgment? The answer is nobody. And here is where you can share the gospel in your lesson. And again, I would always encourage you at some point in, in your message, always share the gospel. Who has broken the commandments of God? We all have. None of us have kept them. That's why God sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay for our sins so that we could put our faith in him and what he did to save us. So, so share the gospel here. But the conclusion in the end is that life is not vanity. There is an end to it. There is a purpose in it. There is a God. There is a judgment and accountability to him. And we need to live our lives in light of that. The fact is, most people in our world live life like Ecclesiastes portrays, under the sun, as if there were no God. And I would suggest that too many so-called Christians also live as if life were just vanity of vanities. Too many people in our churches live as if this life were all there were. We need to live differently. We need to live in the light of God, in the light of judgment, in the light of eternity. And you might ask your class, uh, what are some ways that Christians would live differently if we really believed that this life was not all there was? And the, of course, there are all kinds of answers to that. We could talk about, you know, we, we would not fear death. You know, we would not have a craven fear of COVID. Not, not that we shouldn't be responsible and do the things that we can do, but we ought not fear, uh, fear death. Christians don't fear death. We're going straight to glory. Uh, we, we should be different in that way. We, we don't have a craven fear of death. It would affect the way that we spend our money, that uh, we invest in eternity. Somebody says your checkbook or your bank statement shows how much you really believe. How much of your money are you investing in eternity? And it affects your morality. If you're living for this life, if this life is all there is, then go do whatever feels good. 
But if you believe like Ecclesiastes says here, that God will bring every act to judgment, then you're going to restrain yourself from some things because you know you are accountable to God. Well, you and your class can think of others, but if we are Christians, we are not going to live like life is vanity of vanities. We're going to live a life of purpose. We're going to live a life for God in light of eternity. So I hope you'll use this scripture to encourage your group to do that this week. Well, I enjoy praying for those of you who leave comments. Uh, I do that on Saturday night and also on Sunday morning. So if you leave a little something with your name on it in the comment section, I surely will pray for you. I hope this little overview will help you as you share God's incomparable word with your group this week.